Cody, I uh, came up with your new Top 100 Games theme song. Oh, great. Let's hear it. All right, here it goes. Some people think that it would be lame Sitting around reviewing games Cody does that and ain't it a shame Now my friends, it's time for Cody's Top 100 Games. What do you think? I don't like it. Ah, he likes it! Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that would really like to know more about your mother. Is she single? Do you think she'd like Applebee's? Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and continue on with my top 100 games of all time. Today we're taking a look at number 40 through 31. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and get started. My number 40 is a game that is a, a brilliant space economic game. It is Eclipse from Asmodee. Eclipse is a wonderful game where you are colonizing worlds, you are engaged in research, you have combat, you can upgrade your spaceships. It's it's really kind of a 4X game. Um, you know, you're going out there and exploring and, and exploiting and exterminating and extinguishing the love between the stars. I forgot the last X. But it's a great game, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's really a lot of fun. Uh, you got cubes, so it's kind of Euro-y. It's very Euro-y. It's, 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 you know, it kind of looks like it's going to be kind of an Ameritrash game, but it's not. I mean, you do have dice rolling, there's some combat, but it feels very Euro-y in the way it works. And it works very well. I really like Eclipse. Uh, this is my number uh, 40. It was 41. My number 39 is a game that fell one point. It was my 38 last year. This is a fantastic game. The expansion just came out, and I'm so excited. I haven't played it yet. I should be playing it soon. And this is a tremendously fun game, Betrayal at House on the Hill. Betrayal at House on the Hill is a wonderful haunted house game. It's perfect for this spooky, spooky Halloween. Uh, essentially, what you do in this game is you take on the role of a character, and these characters are going through a house that is procedurally generated. As you move into a room, you take a tile and you slap it down there, and you, you move into these different rooms. But every time you go into different rooms, there may be different symbols. And once you've gone into enough rooms with enough symbols, you, you, you're rolling dice. If the die roll is, is a certain number based on the symbols and the cards you've drawn, then you trigger something called the haunt. And this is going to happen after a lot of the house has been explored. But the haunt is essentially going to make one of you a traitor who turns against the others and must now try to defeat them. And it becomes kind of a, an all-on-one game. Uh, it's very interesting because there are like 50 different haunts in the base game. You know, I've played this game a dozen times probably, and i never played the same thing twice. And you get all these really fun stories and this kind of B-movie horror narrative. It is really fun, tremendously fun. I really like Patrol on the House of the Hill. I'm really looking forward to the expansion. So this is Patrol on the House of the Hill from uh, Avalon Hill. That is my number 39, was my 38. My number 38 was my 39. Kind of weird how that works out. This is a game, an IP game, that um, just nails the IP. Really makes you feel like you are part of that uh, IP. More than just about any tabletop game I've ever played has. And this is Star Trek Fleet Captains from WizKids. Now, in Star Trek Fleet Captains from WizKids, essentially, you take on, uh, in the base game, a number of Federation ships or a number of Klingon ships as you're exploring kind of a, a new, unknown area of space. You have little tiles that are face down. As you move into them, you flip them up. They tell you things like how big that area of space is and, you know, if there's a planet there or if there's a, a black hole or a star or other interesting thing. And what that means is uh, what your ship may not be able to go through. You, you've got the hero clicks thing going on where you set different settings which give you engine power, weapons power, shields. And as you're, as you're going throughout the map, you're going on different missions. You're trying to complete missions to gain points. You're also settling uh, bases. You can get points by settling bases and going on you know, away missions and stuff. And it's really, really a lot of fun. It's really Star 
Trek in a box. There's encounters you can have, which is, you know, you, you'll meet Q or, or other characters from the Star Trek universe. And it's, it's very fun, very interesting. They they have expansions. They have the Romulan expansion and a Dominion expansion, and they both bring some fun and interesting things to it. Uh, different kinds of missions. Um, it's good. I I I I I really like it. I I don't play it as much as I used to. I I need to play it more because every time I do, I have a blast. This is Star Trek Fleet Captains from Wiz Kids. This is again my number thirty eight. It was my number thirty nine. My number 37 is my favorite game in all of this series. This is Axis and Allies Pacific. Now, this is the one that came out, um, you know, 15 years ago, not the one that came out a few years ago, which I have and have not yet played. But the original Axis and Allies Pacific is a great game of both naval and land combat. To me, whenever I would play the original Axis and Allies, one of my favorite things was the big naval battle we'd always have uh, between the Americans and the Japanese at some point in the game. And in fact, if the game was lost earlier than that, we'd still take what forces we had and we'd have a roll-off to see who would win that Japanese-American naval battle. And I love the Pacific game because it's the best of that. It's, it's a lot of that. I really like it. Um, it's uh, Japan versus Britain and the United States. And time's kind of on Japan's side, and Britain and the United States have to work and have to get there, have to defeat Japan before Japan can just, you know, win through attrition. It, it's really a lot of fun. I really enjoy this game tremendously. So that is Axis and Allies Pacific. That is number uh, 37. It was my number uh, 33. did fall a little bit, but this, again, is from Avalon Hill. My number 36 is a game that fell a little bit. It was my 32. This is a tremendously fun game of alternate history, but uh, fun, imaginative combat between giant flying battleships. This is Leviathans from uh, Catalyst Game Labs. And this game is, like I say, it's this alternate history where they develop this kind of substance that lifts heavier-than-air objects and... It lifts battleships, and so you have these floating battleships on these stands. They're flying, and, and and they're and they're and they're shooting at each other. You keep track of the damage you take on a little dry erase sheet. It's tremendously fun. I really, really enjoy Leviathans quite a bit. Um, I was upset because they were they were had all these expansions planned. The base game comes with French and British ships, and I remember they were talking about Italian ships and German ships, and and this was going to be a big thing. But I guess it just never caught on the way they hoped it would. Otherwise, we would have seen more of this. But Leviathan's absolutely fantastic game. Catalyst Game Labs. Once again, this is my thirty six. It was my thirty two. Number 35 is a game that last year was my number 35. Uh, it was much higher on my my first year. In fact, I think I put it in my top 10. The first year I did it, I think it was 10 probably. Uh, it slipped because I just I haven't played it enough, and I really need to go back and play it again. I think I just played it once or twice, and it was really a lot of fun, I thought. But I just, you know, it, to be blunt, I remember a lot about it, but, but, but I, I, I feel like... Not enough. And I want to go back and play it again to kind of remember it. But still, I had tremendous fun when I played it. This is Rex um, from Fantasy Flight Games. Rex is a game that was uh, originally uh, based on the IP of Dune. Uh, when Fantasy Flight Games wanted to reprint this game, I guess the property rights uh, for Dune were not available. And so they went ahead and they created uh, a game set in... Fantasy Flight Games Twilight Imperium Universe. And this is fun. It's it's essentially the fall of the Galactic Empire, uh, the fall of Mechatel Rex, the capital, and you're on the capital while this is going down. You've got humans who are control a fleet that's bombarding places. You've got uh, uh, the race that can like predict the outcome. If they correctly predict the winner, then they win. Um, you've got a... Uh, 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 you know, the, the, the Barony of Letnev are there and, and all sorts of kooky, kooky races that each have distinct and different powers as you're moving along the, this, this planet. 
Really enjoyed it. I, I like it because it's got a lot of betrayal um, and, and alliances that you're forming and negotiation. And if you know me, you know I love games that have a lot of negotiation. And this one has a lot of that. But I also like how in, in battles, some of your some of your uh, uh, characters that are fighting the battles can actually betray you and turn against you. And it's really fun. I, I really enjoy this one quite a bit. This is Rex, Final Days of the Empire. And this, of course, is my number 35, was my number 35 from Fantasy Flight Games. My number 34 is a game that fell just a little bit. And this is um, a game I haven't played as much as I actually thought I was going to, because it was a lot of fun, but there's a bit of a learning curve, and, and it's it's a little intimidating, I think, to some people. Frankly, it's a little intimidating to, to, to me to play again for, for various reasons. Um, mostly the combat, which is very cool, but it's a little... You, you've got to learn it. It's not hard, but, it, but, it, but it's something kind of unique. This is another game from Fantasy Flight Games, Forbidden Stars. Forbidden Stars is a game that is set in the um, Warhammer universe, you're the Space Marines, or you're the Orcs, or you're the Chaos Marines, or you're the Eldar, and you each have different objectives. Now, you've got this big map uh, that are big tiles, and you're essentially trying to move your units to conquer planets that begin the game in other people's systems. So, it encourages combat. Indeed, combat is absolutely essential for this game. You're not going to win this game by turtling, and I like that a lot. I love the science fiction theme, love the artwork, and as I say, combat is fun. It, it can be kind of long, and if you're not in the combat, you're kind of waiting a little while, but still, it's a fantastic game. Now, this was one of the games that was licensed to Fantasy Flight by Games Workshop, and that partnership has ended. So, what that means is Forbidden Stars is, as I understand it, out of print. If you can get your hands on a copy, do it. Find it, enjoy it, it's a great game. So, this is uh, Forbidden Stars from Fantasy Flight Games. This is my number 34, it was my number 30. My number 33 is a game that has fallen 10 points. It was my 23. It's a game that I really like. It's really innovative. It's really, uh, really different. And I've never played a game that, that, that really strikes the word in my head, balance. You have to, It's a balancing act all through this game. A three-way balancing act. And I really, really like it. I just... I haven't really played it much since last year, and that is disappointing because it's awesome. This is Churchill from GMT Games. Churchill from GMT Games is a game that recreates um, World War II, but it's not the military components of World War II, at least not not in a, in, in, in a traditional way that a war game does. There's an abstract way you're fighting the, the battles. Rather, this is a game that strives to recreate the conferences of World War II between Winston Churchill, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, slash Harry Truman, and Joseph Stalin. And what you're doing is, in the game, you've got this like three-way debating table, and you are debating the issues, and you're playing cards, you're using them to debate the issues, moving the issues closer to you, and closer, uh, so you have control over them, so you're getting more points, but you're also kind of, what you do in the debating, kind of influences what happens on the battle boards, the European theater and the Pacific theater, and that in turn is going to influence the next conferences. It's very innovative, very fun, you can play like a full game, which is pretty long, or you can just play kind of certain scenarios which cover certain time periods but i really enjoyed this game because it's so unusual it kind of plays like a three-way twilight struggle not quite but there's it, it kind of felt like that at times it's a fantastic game i mean it's just like i say balance and wow this is churchill from gmt games this is my number 33 it was my number 23 Number 32 is a game that I that I moved up a few spaces, not because I've been playing a lot. I haven't. I haven't. It's been a while since I played this game. But it's a game that I just, man, every time I think, every time I talk to Zach and, and I rem, I'm remembering all of the great times we had with this game and what an impact this game had on me uh, and how much I would like to play it again. But it's not a game, you know, it's a long game, a lot of players. It's not a game you're going to be able to get off the shelf that often. And I'm including not simply the main game, but also kind of one of its standalone expansions uh, together. I'm talking about Diplomacy and Colonial Diplomacy from Avalon Hill. The Diplomacy games I love because there's no chance at all in these games. It's all pure strategy, 
pure strategy. And there, it's tremendously fun. Backstabbing, you will lose friends when you play this game. Or at least you will significantly strain your friendships. If you're a good liar, like I am, you'll do quite well in this game. But, um, y you know, it's not a game you want to play with somebody that can't take in-game betrayal. Um, if they take a game too seriously, you're really going to have problems. Some of my favorite gaming moments are from Diplomacy. If you've seen any of the other lists where we talked about it, one of my favorite games of all time was a game in which Sean and Zach were playing, and they had the biggest fight they've ever had as brothers in their lives because of that game. So, I mean, you know, if, if you can drive a family apart, then a board game has done its job as far as I'm concerned. This is Diplomacy and Colonial Diplomacy from uh, Avalon Hill, and a uh, tremendous lot of fun. That was a... They were, rather, I had them at uh, 37, and now they are at 32. And finally, my number 31 fell two points. It was 29. Fantastic game. I love it. And I was actually kind of surprised it went down, because I played it a few times again, and I just... Man, every time I play it, I get such a big kick out of it. This is Letters from Whitechapel, uh, currently published by Fantasy Flight Games. Letters from Whitechapel is a game of hidden movement in which one of you is Jack the Ripper, and the rest of you are police officers. Up to five people, I believe, will play police officers trying to hunt down Jack the Ripper. Uh, every night, Jack commits a murder, and he has to make it back to his hideout before the police... Uh, can catch him and arrest him. Brilliant game. Very tense. I, I will say this. I have never played a game that stressed me out as much as Letters from Whitechapel when I am playing Jack. And I, it was funny because I played a game recently. I didn't really play. Um, there were too many of us, but there were uh, the six, five police officers and then the one person who was playing Jack. It was all the first game. So I kind of helped Jack. And I kind of advised Jack. And, and, I, and I, uh, Clarissa was playing Jack. And so I was kind of telling her what to do. And she was freaking out. She was like, oh, I've never, I've never been this scared in a game before. And you will. It's fun. But it's intense. I remember one time when I played it, I literally thought I was going to have a heart attack. That and the, the bacon burgers probably contributed to it. But anyway, it's a great game. That's from Fantasy Flight Games, Letters from Whitechapel. That is my number uh, 31. It was my number 29. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. That's my numbers uh, 40 through 31. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Please, i love to hear from you. Please leave a comment here on YouTube, on BoardGameGeek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are The Discriminating Gamer, and i got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, we have time for viewer mail. Now, as you know, uh, we get sacks and sacks of letters and dump trucks coming at us every single day, and we cannot possibly answer all of the letters uh, that you have mailed to us with love and, and the ones with hate, but we do our best to answer those ones we can, so we're going to answer one for you today, and I, I, I hope this will illuminate, uh, will illuminate, be, be illuminating for you. Dear Cody, I'm a big war gamer, and I love GMT games. But I can never figure out what GMT stands for. Could you please tell me what GMT stands for? Sure. GMT and GMT Games stands for Got Milk Tonight. Got Milk Tonight. They're big milk drinkers at GMT. Big milk drinkers. They drink a lot of milk. They like that lactose. They're big milk drinkers. They They've got cows in their production offices. It, they do. I have been there. I've seen them. See, they, 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 they plan their DRMs and then they squirt, squirt. That's just got milk tonight. 